Welcome to Breakpoint This Week. I'm Shane Morris, here with John Stone Street to talk about the stories of the week from a Christian worldview perspective. And John, I feel like if there was a week that is to 2020, what 2020 is to the decade, this has to have been it. As we speak, parts of several cities are burning and being destroyed by rioters. Uh, people have been killed in those riots in the wake of another police shooting of a black man. Hurricane Laura is plowing through Louisiana right now, leaving, as we record this right now, several people dead already. And on top of all of that, the evangelical world has been rocked by another sex scandal involving the head of its largest university in America. So it's just an incredibly hard week to be doing a program like this. But, you know, I think the truth matters and how we think about even the bad news uh, that comes out as Christians matters deeply. Yeah, well, I just want to start by saying that our, uh, our thoughts and prayers are certainly with uh, the residents uh, in Louisiana and even other states. Uh, yeah. As we are recording this, Louisiana has taken the brunt of uh, Hurricane Laura, uh, but it's certainly still scheduled as it weakens to head straight up the U.S. Um, it doesn't seem like the flooding is quite as bad as, as sort of the uh, apocalyptic predictions. Uh, that were made ahead of time, but the winds certainly were bad, and there certainly is more than enough water and damage, and mm -hmm. this was going to last a long time. So, you know, we just want to begin that way um, because that's the thing. We spend so, so much time on this program talking about the world that we live in, right? I mean, the actual events, and then kind of nature steps up and goes, you know, here I still am. I mean, you know, we talk about movies and and Netflix series and political conventions. And these are all cultural artifacts that humans have kind of superimposed on the created order. And yet we still live in a world in which the created order groans, um, subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the choice of the image bearers. Uh, you know, this is subjected uh, it to futility, it, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, this is where you kind of go, oh, Romans actually is saying something here that we need to pay attention to. But you know, real lives are being uh, impacted. I mean, you, you've got people that are already dealing with perhaps unemployment uh, because of COVID. Um, you have, you know, rescue efforts and trying to figure out guidelines, you know, for face mask while you're trying to rescue people from drowning. I mean, these, these are just bizarre conversations that were taking place in the week heading into Laura, and, you know, and are still taking and place. And isn't Louisiana one of the poorest states in the country as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I you know, it's, it's, uh, you've got these kind of regions of the South, yeah. um, you know, where, where some of this is, is the truth. But, you know, that's the Southern US. And, you know, whereas the Southern US was dealing with um, what we would call natural evil, evil in which there's not really a human cause or intention. Uh, you know, this would be like accidents and, mm. and natural disasters, but still things we look at and go, something went wrong, right? Like this has caused pain. It's not just an inconvenience. It's actually even more than that. Uh, and then on the Northern, uh, you know, uh, side of the U S um, we had another act of moral evil in Kenosha, which Wisconsin, this has unfolded over the course of the whole week because it first started with the, uh, the shooting by police officers of a 29 year old black man, Jacob Blake, seven times in the back. I mean, the footage was, really difficult to watch and that immediately sparked more protests that that spilled over into violent uh, uh riots and then of course we th that evil was compounded by uh more violence by a sort of counter protester militia group where a 17 year old boy uh shot and killed one individual and then shot two others uh, as he was fleeing from these protesters. So, and then this has just set the country on fire. I mean, I can't, the news feed, and I've got friends texting me all day long saying, did you see this? Did you see that? Are you watching this unfold? Our, I've, uh, you know, someone said, our country is falling apart before our eyes. And that's what it feels like, John, it, it, watching the newsreels. That's what it feels like, despite what, you know, CNN might, might say while standing in front of, <laughs> while their anchor stands in front of burning cars and stuff, you know, mostly peaceful protests. Really? Yeah, I mean, look, the only conclusion we can come to at this point is, is that we're not okay. Yeah. Um, culture, uh, the health of a culture is directly related, um, you know, to all kinds of factors. Uh, the health of family, the, the health of uh, kind of the religious uh, impulse, the ability to delay gratification, control oneself, you know, as a kind of a cultural norm. Um, you, you know, there's just all of these things. And, you know, 
it's been so dizzying with this particular story out of Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, and the evil multiplying on evil, multiplying on evil, and then context being added to videos uh, on all sides. And I mean, this stuff is changing. It'd be impossible to render any verdict. Uh, about here's exactly what happened, why it happened, what the police officers were thinking, what this, you know, this guy who clearly this 17 year old kid who shouldn't have been in Kenosha to begin with, but was, and then, you know, was attacked and then all this sort of stuff. There, there, there's going to be way more details that are going to provide context. I mean, we're still waiting on details to provide some sort of context on the George Floyd killing. Um, and, uh, and, and yet this keeps happening. You know, this week, um, Shane, the former president of Prison Fellowship, uh, you know, was, was our kind of our birth mother, if we could say it right, where Colson Center came from. Uh, Bishop Garland Hunt from uh, the Father's House, a church in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, led our prayer time. You know, we would continue this week by week time of prayer with a couple thousand people that are joining us every Wednesday morning. It's really been a meaningful time. But he talked a little bit of that weariness, you know, just like, you know, we, we're not even getting a breather uh, between these incidents that are setting off. And again, um, I think about what Andy Crouch said during our Truth Love Together event. It's like we need less information and more context because before we get before we even get context, everyone's absolutely certain about what happened. Right. And the only thing we can be certain of is that we're not OK. And what's becoming clear, Shane, is that all the issues that we looked at this week, that we confronted this week, and I think this is a really important thing for us to remember, no election is going to solve any of them. <laughs> it, it, you know, there's not a political solution. You start with hurricanes, there's not a political so solution to hurricanes, despite what you know, some people promise that seas will stop <laughs> rising and stuff like that. There's not a political solution to the race issue. There are political solutions to race related issues, but the the fundamental issue of the 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 hardness of heart, our inability to listen uh, when 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 Garland Hunt this week spoke about what he you know encouraged he just said something really profound. He said, you know the church cannot uh, solve this problem or be a part of the solution to these race problems if they think about it the same way as the world does. And this is where that stuff really becomes tangible. Uh, the church has to think about these things differently, all of these things differently, as Christians first, not as conservatives or, or, or Democrats or, you know, or anybody in between. And what a sign of the sickness that you're talking about, John, that each presidential candidate feels compelled to offer themselves as the solution to all yeah. of these problems. Like as if, as if either man who's running for the two major parties is going to get into office and be able to fix in four years uh, race relations in America or the weather or a, a global pandemic or any of the, or, or, you know, sex scandals among evangelicals. Although I don't think that uh, the candidates have addressed that particular <laughs> issue, but um, thank God, because I don't want to hear anybody else talking about it right now, but it's, it, it is interesting the way that the candidates feel pressured to offer themselves as the solution and conversely to, pin all of these problems on the other guy and you you get the ridiculous spectacle of the guy currently in office trying to pin stuff on the guy who's not currently in office but but is running for office and the guy who's running for office having been in politics for decades trying to present himself as the you know great solution to as a change uh, as a change, yeah, as a, agent, as a change yeah. agent right because and, um, and it's part of the game right i mean the parties are doing it to each other right i mean you can certainly see that um you know, policies are not created equal. And we've said it before, look, elections matter because policies matter and because people matter. But, but it's just, it, it just becomes clear that the brokenness of the world is not a political one. And so any worldview that claims to be able to say, hey guys, I'll fix this problem. I, mm -hmm. I figured out what's wrong with the world and I'll fix it. Like that's, that's the worst stories of the 20th century right there. And, uh, and we're seeing what happens when those things, you know, can't be fixed. Uh, I, I was just really moved this week. And I encourage everybody to come to breakpoint.org and we'll link to a video of the message that um, Garland Hunt shared with us. Um, just just that, that, that basically the culture's out of options. If not the church, then who, right? If not Christians providing some form of restoration, uh, being able to speak to both kind of the personal side of evil 
and the um, and the structural side of, of evil, and being able to offer some sort of path forward. I, you know, the the problem with any political solution to this is. Shane is is what Steve Garber calls it's not a big enough worldview. It doesn't have the resources to handle the depth of the brokenness. Um, so yeah, I mean that's the story of this week, if you ask me. I, I'll tell you what I appreciated most about Garland's talk was the well, first of all, the passion. I mean, you could tell that he's he's so deeply passionate about this, and he's it seemed like he was on, almost on the edge of tears a couple of times. But the the other thing I really appreciated about it is how he he navigated the shoals. Of, of partisan politics where he really said, okay, this is, he, he demonstrated that he understands that this is the way one side feels and thinks, and they feel that, you know, there's their very society is under threat and falling apart and, and being attacked by uh, an anarchist movement. And then he says the other side feels that they are um, persecuted for the color of their skin and that they are, uh, that they're in danger on a regular basis in a, in, in a, from precisely those institutions that are set up to protect them and to serve them and to mm -hmm. uh, keep them safe in their homes. And so that's the source of all the passions coming from either side. And, and then he described Christians as a, a, a group that can actually navigate between those two extremes, understand both sides, and then bring truth to bear and, uh, and treat everyone as image bearers. So it was a, it was a really cool talk. I second your recommendation. Yeah, well, join us each week. I mean, next week we'll have uh, Kay Cole James, the president of the Heritage Foundation. And I mean, these are just wonderful times where we're praying out of the scripture. We're praying out of the history of the church. We're being encouraged each week on how we can pray better in the coming week. Uh, this isn't kind of a, a drive-by prayer time where pray once and you're good for the week. It's, it's hopefully a way to think, how can I pray more intelligently, more informed, uh, how can I pray more theologically sound uh, in the week ahead? And we'll be doing it every uh, every Wednesday morning. Um, you can go to our, our Breakpoint Facebook page as well and follow us, and you can find the video from the first two weeks. Uh, first was led by Pastor Rick Warren, and then uh, the one and only Oz Guinness, and and now Garland Hunt. So it's uh, it's been I, I've been really challenged. Well, folks, we're going to take a real quick break. We'll be right back after this to talk about more of the stories of the week from a Christian worldview perspective. Stay with us. We're back here on Breakpoint this week, talking about the stories of the week from a Christian worldview perspective. And John, one of the stories that dominated the headlines on my news feed and on the sites I visit and, and all the apps I look at before the hurricane hit and before the race riots uh, resumed in Wisconsin was, uh, was out of Liberty University, which is the largest Christian university in the country, and I, I think possibly in the world, actually. Jerry Falwell Jr. was the longtime president there, son, of course, of the late Jerry Falwell, uh, who led the moral majority, very famous figure in, in, uh, Christ, in American Christianity, evangelicalism in particular, and uh, a very venerated figure, someone who's been um, influential in so many people's lives through both the university and through um, his, his teaching as a Christian leader. Well, this... Uh, this unfolding gradual scandal blew up this week with uh, details emerging about uh, sexually immoral behavior on uh, Jerry Jr.'s part. He was, he went kind of back and forth with the uh, leadership there at Liberty and eventually uh, determined that he would resign. And he actually took a, a something like a $10 million severance package there. And all of this was just out in the open. Everything was hanging out for ev for the whole world to see and it was just a, a painful news cycle to watch for uh, for Christians who many of whom either went to Liberty or like me know uh, many dear friends who went to Liberty and now just feel like their not only the, the, their degree but their very name and their faith has been dragged through the mud by this. So what a I mean what a horrible spectacle to have to watch. You know the worst thing about these stories is that it's an occasion for the wicked to rejoice in wickedness and. You know, that's really what happened. I mean, the, the, I saw one headline from the Washington Post that basically said that the particular kind of um, accusation, the sin that uh, uh, Jerry Falwell Jr. is accused of committing is, is uniquely susceptible to evangelicals because they have so many sexual hangups. I mean, it was so weird. It was, and, and just, you just kind of look at headlines. And that was in the Washington Post where basically repressive sexuality is what causes this yeah. as opposed to, you know, you know, the God given, you know, design for marriage and everything. Else. Well, it, and, it, it was particularly ugly given that this particular, this 
type of behavior was um, the subject of a slur often directed by right wingers right. to left wingers during you know the last election well and and that's the thing is this obviously the, the story is loaded for a number of reasons and i don't want to get into that and i felt no. like there were too many evangelicals too many right. christians who have a negative opinion of liberty or of falwell or of trump and basically saw this as a wonderful opportunity to you know to to again to rejoice in wickedness and what i just i felt like it was a gut punch all week mm -hmm. and uh, my, my history with Liberty University goes way back to my earliest uh, memories, honestly, with, at the Christian school where I attended that was connected with Liberty. Jerry Falwell Sr. came and spoke at my church more than once. I've spoken at Liberty. I've got very good friends. Actually, one of some of my oldest friends on the planet um, is, uh, you know, are, are part of that community and have been. Old in friendship or old in years? Yes. And uh, the answer is, is a yes. But, but you know, I, the, the, what happened this week was, it, it, if you know how this works, I mean, there's people that have been there for decades, have watched that transition from Jerry Sr. to Jerry Jr., have seen so much of this work, and, and now they've had to walk their kids through things that they shouldn't have to walk their kids through. They had to explain things. That, and, and then, of course, if you're on campus there, especially now, you, you realize what, man, what a, what, a, what a divide there is from the everyday life uh, with spiritual formation directors and, and RAs trying to pour into the lives of students and a very vibrant chapel and spiritual formation and serious professors and all kinds of different things. And then you've got the executive life uh, that clearly we're learning more and more about. And it's it's so, so different. And so here you have uh, people that have spent years of their life pouring into this place, pouring into this project, and now they are forced to deal with shame. And it's not their fault. And, and, and you know, one of the things we talked about this week, and I, 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 was, I, I couldn't figure out exactly how to talk about this well without joining this chorus where you're just kind of celebrating the wickedness or at least reveling in the fact that somebody else got caught. The lesson to be learned here is, is that none of us should go without accountability. Um, when we go without accountability, when we, uh, when we do that, it's, it's, it's a, uh, it's, it's a destiny that there's going to be a fall, but, but the, the sin that we think is private doesn't have private consequences. That was the lesson that stood out most to me, John, was that it's good that this is now out in the open and revealed and dealt with for no other reason than that there always is a price for private sin. You can't, you can't separate who you are in private from who you are publicly. You're going to be the same person. And that sin is going to eventually come forth and manifest itself and, uh, and then wreak destruction all around you in, in the institutions you're involved with, with your family, with your church, e everywhere. And then, I mean, this, the verses that come to mind watching the destruction wrought by Jerry Falwell Jr.'s sin it, it, are, are like, you know, when, uh, when Paul tells the Corinthians that it's actually reported that there's sexual immorality among you of a kind that's, you know, reviled among the pagans even, or where, where he says that, um, you know, according to Deuteronomy, you should purge that kind of evil from among you or, or where Peter gives a positive admonition where he says, live such good lives among the pagans that, you know, they'll see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of his visitation. And that's, that's the, what we should be striving for. And instead we see exactly the opposite happening. It is uniquely destructive. When yeah, but it's important to say, Shane, that, that liberty is a big, big place. I mean, it is big. Yes. It is a huge place. And there are, there are uh, dozens and dozens and dozens, and I dare say hundreds um, of people who have lived that Peter way for years, mm -hmm. investing in to an institution that has become a remarkable place. I mean, I know some of the fiercest critics of the leadership of that school who send their kids to that school. Why? Because they do a lot of things really well. And there's a, it's not for everyone, just like no college is for everyone. But, but that's what's so hard is that there, there, there's, um, you know, we, one of the things that becomes clear, and it's actually clear in another story that we'll talk about in the next segment, but that hidden evil is evil that is allowed to flourish. And sometimes the best day is the hardest day when that stuff comes to light. And it's been a really hard week for people on campus. And I, I, I think 
we need to pray for the school. Uh, we need to pray for, you know, the literally hundreds of people that are on campus right now that love the Lord and they're trying to do the right thing. And they're mentoring and they're leading and they're teaching and they've got, you know, a real commitment to Christ on a number of levels and they're forced to kind of, this has been thrown into their lap and it's, uh, it's, it's a really hard thing uh, for them to do. And, and you can see that stark contrast, right? Between what Paul told the church at Corinth and what Peter encouraged the body of Christ. And it's, it was right there on that same campus and uh, it's, 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 it's awful. So may, may God bring some mercy to that place and encourage the people that have given their lives, uh, you know, to this vision. And, uh, and, you know, have for a really long time. Yeah, faithful Liberty students, faculty members, all of you. I mean, I can't tell you anything, but don't weary in, in doing good. Don't grow weary in it because it has its, it has its reward. And um, you'll be rewarded, uh, especially by the one who sees in secret, as Jesus said. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back after this to talk about more of the stories of the week from a Christian worldview perspective. Stay with us. We're back on Breakpoint this week, talking about the stories of the week from a Christian worldview perspective. And John, another story that we just have to hit is the GOP convention, uh, nominating President Donald Trump as the candidate for uh, the, the election coming up in November here, because we covered the Democratic convention. And there are a couple of things that we just need to, to mention and talk about coming out of this convention, because it's going to be the thing that dominates headlines uh, as we move into election, uh, an incredibly contentious election season here. Well, it, you know, it, I think one of the things we can come out uh, of, you know, having looked at both the Democratic National Convention and the GOP Convention is that, especially in the sort of divided political climate we're in, nobody's mind is is changed. I was listening to a podcast this week, and and you know, say it was somebody saying, you know, I'm pretty empathetic, and I feel like I can even understand people who disagree with me about almost anything, but. I don't understand people who haven't made their mind up, you know, on the political <laughs> stuff, you know, I can actually a little bit more, uh, you know, just because of, uh, you, you know, the, 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 the challenges of putting together the whole equation of, you know, character plus policy plus team plus cabinet plus political party plus moment in history. And you, I mean, that stuff is, is, is really a part of things uh, for, for, for everybody. Well, uh, I can't example, understand those who, who, if there's anyone out there, I doubt there is anyone, but I couldn't understand anyone who says, you know, they're just both so good. I can't, I can't pick between them. They're, they're both amazing candidates. I can't understand those who are saying, oh man, this is just, how, yeah, how do I it, choose between these awful options? Well, it, but, but you know, that's the thing is that this election really matters because so much is at stake. And it also matters because of not even the top of the ticket, but everything kind of all the way through the ticket. I, you know, I don't think I don't think either convention has swayed anybody in the middle. I, I, I think that that's going to be a pretty minimal impact. The best that it's done is going to be to basically sell to the various bases just what the stakes are. Uh, and why it's so important to, you know, to mobilize them. I think that's what we're seeing. There's been some kind of, you know, really, you know, enjoyable God and country sorts of things out of the, uh, you know, this week. Um, but I, again, I don't think anything is is, is going to be changed because of that. But the other thing, though, that did happen this week is the, that, that I think we need to talk about is that there was some video footage that some of us have been kind of waiting for for a while that was that was released, uh, which is, you know, this whole kind of long, years long, uh, you, know, uh, you know, saga between California and the Center for Medical Progress, uh, David Daleiden. Uh, and one of the things that came out of, you know, these undercover videos, of course, that have been accused of being faked and forged and doctored and all kinds of things, even though the entire videos have been released, is that the Center for Medical Progress and the attorney for David Daleiden and for CMP were able to actually uh, depose the people that were caught on camera in these undercover videos. And now the videos of those depositions have been made public. And that happened this week. It's a story that many, many people miss, but it is a fascinating story because really what you get to see is what do these Planned Parenthood execs from LA and from the Gulf Coast, what do they think they're doing when they're 
attempting to procure tissue and try to dance around the regulations that exist? What did they think that they were doing back then when they were explaining, you know, the potential financial opportunity, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to David Leiden? This is yeah. a fascinating set of videos. Well, let me give some background here for our listeners, who, because this is a, a story that's been unfolding since literally before uh, the last presidential election in 2015, 2015. right yeah. in a 2015 undercover video Center for Medical Progress, which was uh, a, a, like a fake, a sting organization that was set up by David Daleiden to uh, capture Planned Parenthood executives and and uh, and heads of organization. They had organization actually admitting that they break the law in the process of uh, harvesting fetal tissue and uh, Mary Gatter was one of the subjects of that and she was a she was a top official at Planned Parenthood and she admitted to quote violating the patient protocol that assures women there will be you know there'll be no changes to their abortion procedures for the purpose of obtaining tissue and you may remember her I think she was the one who joked that uh, you know she's got to sell more tissue because she wants a Lamborghini well she yeah she's she admitted, a, the, the Planned Parenthood of LA she was right, an, right. an exec on the west coast yeah well she she admitted back then to using specious a specious little argument she called it to change the techniques to get an intact specimen of course that's illegal both partial birth abortion and changing the procedure in any way in order to get specimens is illegal well in this deposition footage that was just released um, she admitted that there were legal question marks about whether they could obtain tissue by differing techniques and she kind of tries to dance between uh, th this distinction between procedure and method and technique which are all synonyms bottom line is um, Planned Parenthood is very much aware that they are flirting with or, or, or actually committing felonies here in the in the process of harvesting tissue to be sold they call it donating with a with a series of fees attached uh, fetal tissue and the reason that we care so much about this and the reason why it figured into the last election and the, the reason why we, we care so much about it um, even now is because it's not because we think that these type of abortions are, um, are uniquely wrong in comparison to legal abortions. I think it's because, John, you and I and, uh, and, and David Daleiden and all of those pro-lifers who are working so hard to get justice on this issue and to expose Planned Parenthood for what they really are. Um, want people to see that this organization is not above board. This organization is um, not, not only are they willing to violate the law in the process of doing these, you know, these uh, gruesome and murderous acts, but we want people to see what the, what the acts really look like, what they really are and what they involve. I mean, the reason the partial birth ab abortion ban was put in place, I think in 2003 under president Bush uh, was it, it was because people were persuaded, you know, uh, uh, co Congress members were uniquely persuaded of the uh, grisly and horrific and inhuman nature of that procedure um, that so visibly kills a, a human being. And, and that's the same sort of thing that's happening here. We're exposing the dark deeds to the light. We're helping people see what really goes on behind the scenes. And, and that's why there's unique value to this. I don't think any pro-lifer would be satisfied if Planned Parenthood threw up their hands and said, well, you know what? You caught us. We're doing, we were doing uh, illegal procedures. We're going to stop doing that. We'll only do legal abortions now. No, I mean, yeah. that's, that's not the end game. That's not the, the goal. Well, money hides evil, and right. that's what we've seen. And you can look at the history of the abolitionist movement and uncovering some of the financial and making it less financially profitable, right? Yes. I mean, that's the other part of it. But there's really another thing at stake here, too, which is the health and well-being of the mother. Hmm. Uh, and uh, that's actually one of the, 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 the things that looks particularly damning in this video, uh, not only or does it look like Planned Parenthood is willing to violate this ban on uh, partial birth abortion, but uh, they sign an agreement with patients saying we will not alter this abortion procedure in order to procure intact tissue. And can we just stop again and say, once again, the euphemisms that cover up evil in abortion are just stunning. And there is one of them. But we're going to give you the best care no matter whether we can get this financially profitable you know, tissue sample from, from this fetus. And what they basically admitted, and is especially Mary Gatter, is that she had 
created this language game, the difference between a technique and a procedure and the difference between those two things, which allowed her to basically say, we are going to change the technique or we are going to change the procedure without changing the technique or the technique without changing the procedure, which is a direct violation of the patient agreement, the patient rights agreement form that they have to sign with all uh, the, the, the women who are coming in for abortion services. So what that means now is, is that they're willing to play a language game to change things up against a written agreement that they have with a woman uh, so that the woman's health now takes second place officially uh, behind the potential to profit. And that's really at stake here. Um, we'll link to this video at breakpoint.org. It's something that, again, that I, these videos need to be seen. They need to be understood. They need to be shared widely uh, with as many people as possible. Um, because, you know, you and I talked about this this past week in one of the questions that we were dealing in our Q&A segment on the Breakpoint podcast. It's just a simple question about abortion that gets thrown around a lot. And I, and I think like Abby Johnson uh, in the movie Unplanned, you can see the story. She doesn't really like abortion, but she thinks she's helping people. And, 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 and suddenly this, when the scales fall from your eyes and it becomes more and more obvious, just really what we're talking about here, uh, then the public support for abortion uh, continues to go down. And, that, and I, I think that's what makes these videos really important. I think they've contributed um, uniquely to that end in, in raising awareness and in helping people to, to sort of um, feel the revulsion that they should feel to these, to these procedures. We're seeing people behind the scenes at, who are directly involved in abortion admitting what actually goes on and admitting that women are not first. It's not really about the women. It's really uh, in many ways about this carrying on the organization's existence and profiting off of the destruction of human life. All right, Shane. Well, as we close out today's program, it's time for our recommendations of the week. Just a time where we just share what is good. You know, I once drove by it. Let me, let me explain why we do this. I, I grew up near in, in the South and lived in the South. And the South has some really good things. And then the South has billboards on churches, which are maybe the, the, the dominant source of heresy worldwide. You know, it's just amazing. Some of the things that I saw, one of the sayings that I saw, it was, in fact, it was on in the town where I was living, it was on the billboard of the biggest church in town for like three weeks. And it said, Jesus is the only good thing left in a bad world. You talk about a Gnostic heresy on a billboard, right? It was just, uh, it, it was just flat out not true. And of course, it was ironic because if Jesus is the only good thing left in a bad world, why would I ever come to your church? But anyway, the, the, the point is, is that there are good things in the world, uh, human creations and certainly God's creation that are worth uh, in, in engaging in. So what do you got uh, as a recommendation this week? You know, I'll say something about the church signs down here. Um, the heresy is a prominent issue on church signs, but the the they're also the major source, the, the probably the most significant source of another terrible scourge on society, and that is terrible puns like dad jokes. The stuff I see on church signs down here, it, it's it's really just horrific. It makes you roll every once in a while. Every once in a while, they hit a home run. So uh, you sometimes, know, they, sometimes there's actually a veterinary office near me that. Um, they've been they've been putting animal puns on there for a couple of decades, and they still haven't run out of they still haven't hit the bottom of the well. It's just fantastic. I love it every time I drive by. Well, my recommendation this week uh, is not a not a particular book or resource, but it's a it's a way that you can consume books and resources, and that is reading aloud to your kids. If you are a parent, I can't recommend this enough, and I recommend it on the basis of personal experience and enrichment in my own life. It was so meaningful to me in my homeschool upbringing when, uh, when my mom and dad would read aloud to us, whether it was the great illustrated classic series or uh, these American adventure books that taught history or Little House on the Prairie, you get to walk through the story with your kids and experience it with them in real time and introduce them to um, the world itself and the, the conflicts and issues that, that they will deal with as adults through story. And it's an incredibly powerful way to do it. I, I've got uh, Andrew Peterson's Wing Feather Saga next up on my reading list with my kids. After we finish Narnia, we're on the silver chair right now, we're reading in the correct you know, publishing order. So, uh, and we don't get to it every night. So don't feel bad if, you're, if you're, uh, you, you get busy and you can't do it. But we, we try to mix that in with, um, with readings from scripture on a regular basis. And last night we did 
um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the in the fiery furnace, and and uh, and Nebuchadnezzar's uh, realization that God is is Lord there, and that was so cool because it's it's even this ancient text is formatted in a way that kind of makes kids lean forward, like what's going to happen? Who's the fourth guy in the furnace? And and you're walking through it with them and experiencing it and seeing the wonder in their eyes. And uh, that's a priceless experience. I know because it worked for me and I'm doing the same thing with my kids. So read aloud to your kids. And if you need some recommendations, we will have, uh, we, we regularly do stuff on Breakpoint, but I will direct you to my, uh, my podcast, uh, the Upstream podcast from the Colson Center, because I regularly interview um, authors, who are, are excellent to read to your kids. In fact, just today, John, I interviewed S.D. Smith, who's the author of the Green Ember series, a Christian uh, fantasy writer. And his series is, uh, is well-suited for kids, but he, he insists that there's quite a few adult fans too who, who really love it. So that'll be, um, that'll be on He was inspired to, to write those books from Chuck Colson, driving yes. around the yes. mountains of West Virginia. Uh, Sam's been at my house. We've had a good time. He's a good guy. And those are really, my kids really loved those books when they were younger. Cool. So you recommend them too. That's, that's well, great. yeah, yeah. My wife does a great job um, reading. So my recommendation, I'm going to give you one that's going to be, you know, not going to surprise you. And then I'm going to give you one that's going to shock everyone. I'm gonna, actually going to recommend a reality TV series. Can you believe that? <laughs> I am. No, seriously, I am. John, listen, but, we had to talk about The Bachelor. You got to stop this. this it's not The it. Bachelor. I, I, I do have very good friends that watch The Bachelor. And I they post about it on Facebook. And I think, A, that's really courageous. And B, who are you? But the... um. Now, first, I want to recommend a new book by Ellen Vaughn. Ellen was a longtime uh, co-author with Chuck Colson on uh, various books, uh, but she has just finished the authorized biography of Elizabeth Elliot, uh, the story of Jim Elliot, the the four uh, other missionaries uh, who died at the hands of the Aka Indians back in 1954, made the cover of Time magazine and has inspired literally thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people uh, to serve Christ in various ways. And of course, Elizabeth Elliot goes back into the village where the men were that killed her husband uh, and ends up sharing Christ with them. The, the, the village converts. It's really one of the most remarkable stories as that thing continues to unfold. Uh, but the book is called Becoming Elizabeth Elliot. And uh, Ellen's a, a tremendous writer. And the story is one of those stories that needs to be told and retold and retold and retold. So very excited to jump into that. I'm recommending it before I've actually read it, which I don't usually do. Uh, but this is one of those stories that I think uh, everyone, uh, if, if, if you remember uh, the uh, Jim Elliott story, if you remember Shatter the Almighty, if you remember the story of Jungle Pilot, Nate Saint, if you remember uh, Elizabeth Elliot's books, Passion and Purity and, and so on, then this is something you're going to want to know. So, the other thing I'm going to recommend, again, is a reality TV series. So a bunch of my friends were telling me about how interesting this, this series was called Alone. And Alone, uh, season one is available on Amazon Prime. Uh, basically, they take 10 guys, they dump them on Vancouver Island, uh, where there is something like 5,000 bears and 7,000 <laughs> wolves and a whole bunch of something else that'll kill you, too. What was the other thing that'll Probably kill you? Probably Wolverine. No, 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 it was, um, uh, uh, oh, no, uh, mountain lions. Oh, great. Um, yeah, yeah. And they can take 10 items in there. They have no way to communicate except for closed circuit video cameras uh, so that they can record all this stuff. And there's not a, a lot of these shows have an end date, right? You know, can you survive this long? The, the rules of this game are out of these 10 guys, whoever survives the longest gets $500,000. Wait wait wait, so, wait, 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 wait. So, so stop here for a second because what you just said seems to imply that all the losers are going to die. Well, well <laughs> you, know, you basically you die or you tap this is, out. Is this now, the Hunger Games or a reality they, show? They, okay. They, they do go, you know, when, there was one guy in particular who's uh, had a really uh, aggressive run in with a bear. So they came and rescued him, but you tap out and it was it's fascinating. <laughs> well, it is. It's, it's fascinating the, how psychological this is. And you see the human condition and you see, you know, what happens when people are alone with their thoughts and how do people deal with their past and, and it's just really entertaining, entertaining, but it's also this fascinating thing where out of those 10 guys, like the first four tap out in the first four days. And these are like Marines, you know, huh. but there's something about, you know, being surrounded by mama bears that they were like, 
ain't worth five hundred thousand dollars is not worth my life which that's an interesting lesson right when we have a whole bunch of people that live for far less than that and give up their soul for far less than that and then the winner i mean the the, the, the interesting thing about this is there's no end in sight. Some of these guys are thinking to beat these other guys, I'm going to have to stay out here a year, you know, and the winter lasts 56 days, uh, 56 days. And they come and he was surprised that that was the winter, but it, it's just fascinating. You, you, you see family, you see loneliness, you see what people can and can't live with. And especially, I guess, at a time of kind of, you know, mid COVID isolation, uh, you know, w what is happening in your brain and so on. It, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting show. It's called Alone on Amazon. And I will probably never recommend another reality television series again, but th that one was pretty fascinating. Yeah, John, I heard they were going to do a sequel where they take a bunch of English boarding school boys and dump them on an island with, with pig inhabitants and, and see what happens with that group. Yeah, we talked about that. The Lord of the Flies. This is, but, but they're not together. These ten guys are isolated. They're six. They don't, they don't know where each okay, other. Okay, okay. So they can't, they no can't get oh, into no, no, a war no. with each other or anything like that. No, no, no. There's no like you know alliances and fake survivor. This is quite authentic, right? I mean, this is they basically get dropped off six or seven or eight miles from each other, and they don't know where anyone else is, and they've got to start a fire where it's been raining for 200 days out of the last year. And I mean, it's pretty interesting, but did it's you ever see Les Stroud? Did you ever see survivor man? No, uh, he was I was a Canadian, so. he Canadian survivalist. He was really good. I mean, he, he puts bear grills to shame. I, I don't like bear grills because he, he basically uh, sleeps in a so hotel. Shane just night. confessed that he's been watching some reality. TV okay. All right. But does, does this really count as reality TV? I mean, it, it doesn't fit any of the typical descriptions of, of the genre. But Les Stroud was great. He he did the exact same thing you're talking about here. He would he would get himself stranded in some situation, whether it was in the in the snowy woods of Canada or on a desert island or uh, out at sea or in the desert or something like that. And then he'd just see how long he could survive with a plausible uh, like inventory of things that you could accidentally get stranded without there. So he has to pull apart an airplane in one episode. But if he got in the 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 show you're talking about, he'd he win. Could, he'd win. Hands yeah, down. he'd win. But yeah, what's, what's so interesting about this is that the money didn't end up being the driving factor for why people tapped in or tapped out and why people stayed. So that's just, it's just, hmm. it's just interesting when you think, who are we as human beings? What is it that really motivates us? What's the role of relationships, you know? Yeah. And uh, anyway, so there you go. Reality TV recommendation just for you. Excellent. Well, folks, we're out of time for today. Come to breakpoint.org for links to all the stories John and I have mentioned today on the program. We'll also link you to the resources and reality TV shows that we mentioned here in the uh, recommendation segment. And you'll also find at Breakpoint a worldview commentary updated daily and resources to help you think and live like a Christian in today's culture. So thanks so much for listening. God bless. We'll see you next week.